Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. And before I get to our guests here today, I'd like to remind everyone that if you enjoy this content, to please leave a like and subscribe down below. I'd greatly appreciate it. We have Roxanne Huff on the podcast. She's an IFBB bikini pro coming to us all the way from Massachusetts. But most importantly, she's our current guest. Roxanne, thank you so much for being on. Thank you for having me. Excited. Absolutely. So first of all, what's the weather like in Massachusetts today? It's rainy. It's muggy and rainy. It's gross. Yeah, I, 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 well, it's it's all right. I mean, I just had a guest on from New York earlier on the podcast, and it was still a little bit rainy there, too. But yeah, we had a rainstorm last night, and it's still really, you know, the clouds are out. But hey, it's nice for a person like me with my really pale skin to be able to go out there and not have to worry about getting burnt to an absolute crisp. But why don't you give us a little bit of a backstory on what inspired and what motivated you to get in shape and, you know, get into bodybuilding? Well, I have always had it in my family. My dad was really into bodybuilding growing up, and he built a gym in our basement. Um, it was a full gym. It had everything you needed. We um, And I had I grew up with brothers, and one of my brothers was very, very good at sports, like all-star, you know, played in college. Um, so having those influences, I always had it around me. I worked out when I was younger. I saw them working out. My mom was really into yoga. Of course, you know, there was times when I didn't work out, especially through college. You know, you go through, you know, having fun and everything. But I always got back on track. Like, I really feel whole when I have the gym in my life. So that's what inspired me was just having it in my life. And, you know, if my dad wasn't into bodybuilding and I didn't have brothers that were into sports, I don't know if I would have been drawn to it. So I, I feel like it was something I was meant to do in my life. So it just, you know, so I pursued it. That's awesome. I always say, yeah, it's so important to have that support system and that drive too, especially when starting a sport like bodybuilding. So it's really awesome that, like you said, you had your brothers and you had your dad to, to really motivate you because we have so many times where people, you know, they tried on them on just by themselves and it's really, really hard for them. So to have that support, I mean, I, I, cannot say enough about that to really help people on their journeys. But I always love to say as well, I mean, if you were to walk into a gym with a hundred people, there's a hundred different ways as to how those people got into shape, whether it comes down to their diet, their nutrition, how many reps they do, what exercises they do. I mean, so many little things add up to the overall package that people end up seeing. Was that a struggle for you when you were getting started sort of figuring out what worked best for you? Because I always say, if you were to walk up to someone and say like, Hey, what did you train for that body part? It looks amazing. What works best for them 99% of the time is not going to work as good for you. Was that a struggle for you when you were getting started with the weight aspect where it was finding out what worked best specifically for your body? So I coached myself the first three years and I coached myself into my phone to getting a pro card. Um, it took a lot of, you know, a lot of like messing up and making mistakes and failing and learning from that in order to figure out what works best for my body. Um, so my first competition, I went in very super lean and then I had to like, I had to eat more. Like I, you know, I thought a bikini competition was like, you know, lose some weight, look skinny, go up there, my first show. And it's not that at all. You can't be too thin. So, you know, nutrition, super important. What worked for me was just, uh, you have to be dedicated. You have to give a hundred percent. You can't, you can't half ass it if you're going to do a show. And if you do, you're not going to do well. And I don't go into anything expecting to not do well. I want to do my best and give it my all. And, um, that's what I did. What would you say? Because I always love to, to ask this question because everyone's genetics are different. Everyone always has that one body part that really, really takes off when they start working out. And then everyone always has that one body part that legs behind that they just have to train a lot to get it to catch up to everything else. I'll give you my examples first. So for me, I mean, my back, I had jobs all throughout college of, you know, lifting and loading heavy boxes into trucks. And basically you got a really good back or you quit. So, I mean, the first thing was really what happened to me. But for me, I'm also six foot three. So my lower body is just absolutely shot where, I mean, I have to train it into overdrive just to get it to look like any semblance that I train anything lower body, but what were those body parts for you when you were getting started? Well, my, the hard body parts for me, my arms are really thin. I had no shoulders. I had chicken arms and I had to build my shoulders. It took me three years to get my shoulders where they are now. 
And also my glutes. I've always had a glute hamstring tie-in, and I don't know if your listeners know what that is, but it's um, in your back pose. It's, um, you know, something that's important. I've always had that, but glute roundness, I didn't. So I had to build on my glute roundness. And in order to do that, you have to do the right exercises and you have to eat more um, in your off season. Um, And so that was my hardest parts um is growing those two areas um my good parts I I have a really long torso so my abs I've always had abs and I actually had to lose my abs for my last show because they don't want like a six-pack or anything so I didn't do crunches or anything planks or anything so um yeah and then I this last show I came out of my pro show they told me I was too muscular so now I'm basically not even working out I'm training glutes twice a week and I'm doing yoga and cardio I'm not working out I think I've worked so hard the last three years like I I don't have to work out now (laughs) I don't know so it's like an easy ride now I have my coach told me to relax rest did you ever think about moving up to figure then if since I said that you were too muscular for the bikini show no I don't, I don't want to do, I don't want to be that muscular. I, I'd rather not have as much muscle. I just don't, I don't think that looks good on me. I have short legs, a long torso, and my legs can get pretty muscular. And yeah, it looks good in gym clothes and in, um, like when you're at the gym, but everyday clothes, I don't like the way that looks on me. It's like these, I just don't personally feel comfortable like that. Some the the figure girls and the girls that do it, they like that. It's like, you know, you have a preference of how you want to look. Oh, one hundred percent. I totally, totally understand that. But what would you say is probably the biggest nutritional change that you had to make going from before you started this journey to now? What would you say is probably the biggest thing? I've always ate pretty clean um, or pretty healthy. Um, my biggest nutritional change was eating more. Um, and then getting a coach this year, I hired a coach for nutrition because I didn't, I just didn't, I want to see where I could bring my body to. I still did my own workouts, but he did my nutrition. He guided me with workouts too, like tell me to stop doing this, stop doing that. Um, so I was on a meal plan. So I ate the same thing, six meals and he adjusted it here and there, but every day for about four months. And I was in the best shape of my life. You get used to being like that, um, eating it. And I'm the type of person I can eat the same thing every day. I mean, it's not fun for my relationship because I like to cook for my fiance and stuff and he's got to eat the chicken too, but I just make his a little bit different. No. Yeah. And that's always just so important to just realize that you are going to have to be eating a lot more. Cause that's one of the things that I always think, you know, should be told to people that are trying to lose weight and, you know, maybe put on some muscles that, you know, Hey, you get to eat more than you're eating probably most likely right now, unless you're yeah. eating, you know, like 10,000 calories a day, then, you know, I have nothing for that. But you know, most of the time, you know, it is something that should be a positive when people are talking about it. But I also love to say, you know, if you were to poll the general public, you would find such a small singular percentage of people that would have the drive and the determination just to be able to get into the shape that you need to get into to even do a prep because you have to have that big foundation before you're able even to start your own prep. So going on to a prep, I mean, you are just notching things up to an extreme level where it comes to your diet has to be perfect. You have to get all your meals prepped and on time. You got to get all of your workouts in. What is that lifestyle like for you? And how is that when you change from, you know, just being someone who works out to going into this prep life where everything just becomes so scientific and so exact? Well, prep life is like a a part-time job, if not a full-time job. You got to, during work, when you wake up, you got to take your vitamins. You got to pack your meals for work. Um, You got to work out every single day. I worked out six days in a row and had one day off and then repeat again, six days. Have to go to the gym, even if I'm tired. You get so tired, especially towards the end of prep, because you start to, um, like, you start to get leaner because you want to, peak for that one day so you start to like lose the weight closer to the show in my case I actually had to gain some weight but you get tired especially working like I do group training so I wake up at 3 30 a.m some days and go to work and then I still am training people at 6 30 at night so it was it's difficult but you just have to be super organized if you're not organized then you're not gonna set yourself up for success 
I mean, I'm always fascinated by that because I work nights, so I'm in bed usually around like 3.30, 4 o'clock. So I'm usually going to sleep by the time most of my guests are getting up. So I always find that really, really fascinating. But again, that just adds to the drive and the dedication that, I mean, you need to have in order to compete. But what was that like the first time when you really, really slimmed down and you saw, you know, all those changes that your body has made? Because I, I bet that's just super fascinating just seeing what your body can go through and sort of the metamorphosis that takes place. Yeah, well, especially this prep, I feel like I got in the best shape in my life. And I would look at pictures of myself and I'd be like, oh, my God, that's me. Um, I remember the last last year I did a um, show and that's when my shoulders finally started to come in. And I had been working on those things, hammering on them for like three times a week. And I looked in the mirror one day and it's like. I basically look like a bum all day long. I wear workout clothes. I work in a gym. So, you know, my hair is up. I have a hat on. And then one day I just like, you know, I don't check myself out or put a bunch of makeup on. But one day I was looking in the mirror and I looked at my shoulders and I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, my shoulders look so good. This is what I want them to look like. And I started crying because I couldn't believe that I was there, you know, and that's, that was worth it. All the hard work, all the sacrifice, like accomplishing my goal. Yeah. And I mean, just being able to accomplish those goals, I mean, it really does for a lot of our guests really seem to make everything worthwhile. But I also always say, I mean, to be able to have that confidence to go up on stage in a bikini and pose in front of people, was that something that you had to work on? Or was it one of those things where eventually you were just like, hey, you know what? I worked my butt off. Now it's time to go on stage and show it off. What was that like for you? No, I'm naturally pretty shy. Unless I get to know people, then I'm not shy at all. I mean, I'm one of those per per like people. But um. I had to get a posing coach and my posing was awful my first show and I still had a posing coach. It took me years in practicing posing 15 minutes a day to be um, comfortable with my routine to where it's at now, but still getting on stage before you get nervous because especially this last stage I was on, it was huge and I couldn't even see the judges. So I didn't know like where to angle my body to. So I got stage fright a little bit and I, that hurt my placings. But um you, it takes a lot of practice for me. I'm just not one of those persons that's going to go up there and flaunt my stuff. Oh, yeah. And I, I can't even imagine what that must feel like. But yeah, I always say with posing too. I mean, that's the biggest shocker since I started doing this podcast and having bodybuilders on is that for a lot of them, you know, posing is the hardest thing. And it's just something that yeah. I don't think many people realize. But out of your bikini poses, what would you say is your favorite? And what would you say is your least favorite? I, so... My walk is my least favorite, and I've worked hard on it this year. And I, you know, walking is hard on in heels, but to walk in a way where you're looking like a model, um, I had to practice that a lot because I had no idea. Like my walk at when I first started was awful. Um, the walk is the hardest for me. Um, my favorite is like my transitions, like my front pose and transi- transitioning into my back pose, and then. I like both. I like all of my poses and, and transitions. It's the walk that gets me every single time. Was it hard to develop like your own sort of, I mean, people say that you need to have sort of like your own sass or your own attitude. Was that hard to find your own individual style of that? No, because I'm the type of person I know I don't have sass and I know I don't like, I don't want to come across as sexy either. I just want to come across as, I, I look at myself as cute. So that's how I want to come across. Like, because that's how, I would like to be described. I don't want to be described as sexy. I don't want to be described as sassy because I just don't feel like I'm that way. I just want to, you know, cute. So, you know, I, I tried being like sassy and stuff. It's just not me. I'm like, it's not me at all. So I'm not going to try to be something I'm not. It definitely takes a certain type of person to be those types of things. But yeah, it's it's, it's important too to just realize that, yeah, not everyone's going to be like that. And it adds more variety to it too, to the show. I think when, when people just have different auras sort of around them and they have different styles but now as i said before i'm one of the palest people you'll ever meet in your entire life i mean i cannot go directly into the sun without you know an spf of one million so i've never been tan a day in my life just my thick norwegian skin but bodybuilders get to get tan what is that experience like for you when you finally get that tan on and we have so many guests come on and say you know like you see muscles that you never even knew that you had everything really seems to pop what is that feeling like for you when you finally get to see the finished coat on and you finally realize that like hey this is, I mean, I'm ready. I'm good to go on the stage. Yeah, you do look, you do see the the muscles popping. You look smoother. You look, um, 
you just look more finished. It's super dark. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's a good feeling. Cause it's like, you know, you're about to go on stage and all your hard work is, you know, you got to showcase all your hard work. I personally hate the way the tan feels on me. Cause it's, it's gross. And you go in the bathroom and everything. You have to be careful because you'll, you'll ruin your tan. You can't get water on you. You can't even wash your hands really, because you will um, ruin your tan if you get water on it. So it's, it's, the tan to me is gross. <laughs> but and you do look good in it and you need to be like that because you'll be washed out people don't understand that when you're under stage lights you're washed out and they wouldn't be able to see anything you just look like I don't know you wouldn't see any muscles you wouldn't see any definition you wouldn't see any curves because it's so bright and that's why you have to be so dark it's not like we walk around the gym every day looking that dark and I think some people think we do Oh, no. And I hear that all the time. And probably the number one thing, too, is like kind of like you're saying, like you have to be a statue. You can't stand against anything. You can't really sit on anything. I mean, you got to no. bring your own bed sheets. I mean, that, and that again, that just yeah. adds even more to the checklist of, you know, all the stuff that these competitors have to go through just to be able to get on stage. But I also I ask this for every single guest, whether they be, you know, my bands or my bodybuilders or any any other type of guests that I have on for my bands. I always like to ask, you know, what is that feeling like for you when you get to go on stage and perform live in front of, you know, hundreds of thousands? of people that also applies to the bodybuilders that I have on what is that feeling like for you when you get to walk on stage and show off all that hard work that you've worked months upon months for it's the best feeling in the world to me um you know just accomplishing my goal of getting up there the feeling after is amazing it's 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 like it's also like you can breathe again for a second because you just you, you spent so much time so much focus every second of the day I was thinking of my show you know, there's, there's no time that would go by, no minute that would go by that for one second of that minute, I wasn't thinking of my show. So it's like, okay, I did this. It's, I, I can do anything. Yeah. Like I, it gave me a lot of confidence to, you know, push myself, step out of my comfort zone of being on the stage and doing things that don't come naturally to me. Um, It just feels so good to push yourself to do things like that. And it makes you think you can do anything. It gives you confidence. Absolutely. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more on that. And when you're on stage, does time really seem to speed up or does it really seem to stand still when you're out there? Oh, no. Like, no, it goes by so fast. I don't even hear the music. I can't even see people really in the stage unless, I mean, out in the audience, unless the judges usually are close. But this last show, like I said, they were far away and I couldn't see them. But um, it goes by so fast. It's a whirlwind. You're like, you're like, did I do this or am I dreaming? Like that was quick. Yeah. Well, like even sometimes I can like, the only thing I can compare it to is like being a baseball player and going up to have an at bat. And then all of a sudden it just ends three pitches. If you strike out, which rarely ever happened to me, by the way, I should point out, but you just go back and you're just like, wow, that, you know, that, that went by really, really quickly. But what was the experience like for you winning your pro card? Because for so many people out there, well, I'll say it for my for any guests out there too who aren't familiar. I mean, winning your pro card, that is the affirmation for so many of our guests that, you know, you, you're a pro now. You get to go compete at the pro shows and you, you've earned your pro card. I mean, that is the highlight for so many of our guests' career. What was that experience like for you when they announced your name and you realized that you had your pro card? I, you know, I wanted to cry, first of all. Um, but it's sort of like, it didn't hit you. It doesn't hit me at first. It didn't hit me at first. You know what I mean? It it took me literally probably three weeks for it to hit me. And then I started crying because I was like, oh my God, I did it. But um, it happened so fast that you don't have time to absorb everything. Um, and, you know, for any bodybuilder, getting your IFBB Pro card is, you know, one of the best experiences ever. Um, but, I mean, it. It just, it, it made my life, it made me so happy. I was just so happy. I couldn't believe I did it. But I knew, like, I, I remember before my show, before my national show of getting my pro card, I'd be driving around, driving to work, driving to the gym. I told myself, I'm like, I'm not coming home from that show without a pro card. Like, I told myself, I'm like, I could picture myself on that stage getting my pro card. And it would almost bring tears to my eyes. It's like I envisioned it and manifest it. Like I truly believe in doing that stuff, like manifesting, you know, things that are going to come into your life. Um, so I wasn't going to leave there without my pro card. So I, and I did it. I got my pro card. 
I mean, that's just so awesome because, I mean, just so many people don't realize that struggle just to even get on the stage, but then to win your pro card, I mean, that is just a huge, huge thing. And cause, cause I mean, some people, they get lucky and they win it early on, but then there's people that, you know, take 10, 20 years even to win their pro card. So, I mean, it really is just a major highlight for anyone's bodybuilding career that happens to get it. But now we go to one of the fun questions. What is your go-to post-show meal? Oh, you know, I, my thing I really like is a glass of rosé. So I need to have a glass of rosé because I haven't, you know, you don't drink for a, a long time and um, just chill out with a glass of rosé. And it, it's either a Mexican food because Mexican food's my favorite or burger. But the last time I had lobster mac and cheese. So, you know, it's all over the place. Like I've never even had lobster mac and cheese. Before, is that just mac so. and cheese with lobster mix in it or? Yes, you've never had it. Never had it before. Have lobster there. Well, yeah, it's Massachusetts. That's like the lobster capital of the of the of the country. Yeah. So yeah. Well, yeah. We 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 have we have we actually have um. Well, we have no. We don't have lobster. We have crab for uh Christmas. That's our family tradition. But yeah, we don't have. I have never had lobster in my life. Never. Oh my god, you gotta try it. I know we have a red lobster close by. I've never been to it, but I I I, honestly red lobster is awful. Yeah. Like no, don't go to. You need to like come out to the east coast the um and new england and you need to have some lobster i'm originally from maine so oh, maine's yeah. like the capital oh, yep. of lobsters Yep. No, I was going to say, I did go to the East Coast. We went to Fenway Park. Uh, I, I have a huge baseball family. Or, but uh, So, yeah, we did the whole East Coast tour. But, yeah, we did not have anything there. So, yeah, I definitely – I mean, that's that's one of my things, too, is I always want to go – because that was when I was really young. So I want to come back when I'm older now. But I always love to ask, too, because just – so many people don't realize this. I say it's probably the biggest myth that I love to bust on this podcast is that a lot of the times people don't realize that that look that you guys present on stage, that is not a sustainable look. You're not going to be able to no. look like that 365 days out of the year. I always say, I mean, for so many people that are listening to this, and I've had a few friends, you know, come up to me and say, hey, I love listening to your podcast. It's a shock for them because they think that, you know, hey, these people work their butts off year round to get that stage look. They think that that's, I think part of it is because when people see like these weight loss shows and these people lose this tremendous amount of weight and they're able to keep the weight off, I think that kind of plays in their head where then they're like, oh, these people, yeah. if, they, if they become bodybuilders, they might be able to keep that look, but it's just not the case. What was that like for you when you first first realized, you know, Hey, this is not a sustainable look, even though I've worked my butt off for it. And, you know, I am going to have to put some weight back on. Has that been a struggle for you? And how has that changed as your bodybuilding career has, has evolved? Well, yeah, I, I, it definitely, you're lean, you're ripped. You look like an action figure. Like I feel like Laura Croft when I'm, you know, getting ready right before a show and I'm um, training for a show and going up there. And then you do have to put on weight after and yes it's always hard for me to do that because you're so used to seeing your body one way and then it changes um so at first it's very hard for me to see myself like oh my god it, my shoulders don't look as good anymore that you know and my triceps are like they're not as defined anymore my rear delts but you eventually get used to it and you're like oh I really like this look it's curvier you know it's like I look better with meat on my bones and plus when you go diet down to it like your face gets diet face the skeleton disgusting. face that I like to describe it as yep yeah it's that's what I hate so you know you look so much more healthier after you know, and you vent you slowly get into being comfortable with it it takes me like I've just started I'm about four weeks from my last show being done and I'm just comfortable now like the last two days, I, I put on probably 10 pounds. No, because I went into my show pretty, I had to put on weight, but um, I had to put on weight the last week of my show. How'd you manage to do that? Did they just say you can just eat a lot more now? And I ate 400 grams of Nutella. I was on 6,200 calories a day Wow. because I was going to come in too lean. So, but I put on weight since the show and I wasn't used to going on stage like that, but at the pro level, you can't be like, I feel like you, they didn't want me to be too cut and lean because bikini again, like I had to put on some weight to tone my muscles down, but, and I didn't like that either. I think that's I like, but I had to do it. Yeah. 
No, yeah, that's interesting. That's actually the first guest. So you're going to be our 251st guest, I think, when this gets published. Uh, in like 150th bodybuilder. And you are the first guest that has ever said that they had to put on weight right before right before their show. So that's that. I mean, we have a first for everything every episode. And we, and yeah. we, got, and we got ours done there. But at what point in your journey did you decide that you wanted to help out others and, you know, become a coach and, you know, just help out others with their with their fitness journeys? Well, I've always been into helping people out with fitness. Like it comes back when I was a kid, like I'd be training my friends in the, in my basement gym to lift and stuff. And so I think it was always in me to do that. I just didn't realize it. You know, I thought, you know, I graduated from college, you know, I didn't think I was, you know, I thought I was going to do this sort of corporate world type thing and, you know, make a ton of money. It's not the way it happens. And I'm not happy doing that stuff. So after I started competing, I decided to get back into training again, people, and I had moved to, to another state. So it's like, I'd have to start all over again. So I'm like, well, I might as well just, you know, switch and go back into training people. So I did. And it's the best decision I've ever made um, because I love my job, what I do. I always tell people, if you can find a job that you can help out others, I mean, that is one of the best feelings that you can get knowing that you really helped out others. And I always like to ask too, sort of adding on to that, because we see so many stories on Instagram or so many posts of, you know, people with these weight loss transformations, and we see what it's like for the client and how great it feels for them. But being the trainer and being the person that really was the big driving force for that transformation, for really helping them, what is that feeling like for you? Does that just make everything seem worthwhile? All of the, like you said, getting up at three, a.m. and you know having people work out till like 6 30 does that make everything worthwhile just seeing how much joy and how much happiness you bring to the clients oh yeah it's like seeing other clients achieve their goals and being happy from achieving their goals I feel that's like my greatest one of my greatest joys in life I you know it feels better for me to see them do that than my own you know what I mean I just feel like it's it, it it's like a, it's what you set out to do. And when they do it, it they're so happy. It's like they almost want to cry. So it's very uh, emotional in a way. <laughs> I uh, I can totally understand that because I'm one of those people too where it's like I get the most joy out of you know helping out other people. But we talked about this before we started recording the podcast. I always say the biggest myth that I love to bust on this show. I mean, it's gotten better the last five years with Instagram, but there are still so many women that walk into the gym and they fear that you know if I do one push up, one pull up, one bicep curl, I'm just going to put on you know 50 pounds of muscle overnight. And I I always say that first of all, good luck. Second of all, if that does happen, I will pay you my entire life savings to you know become my my personal trainer, you'd probably get kidnapped by like the government and they would study your genetics to probably, you know, find a way to put it into everyone else. But did you, first off, did you have that fear when you were getting started? And even now, I mean, being a personal trainer, I bet you hear that all the time. How do you like to respond to that? Oh yeah. I, I remember when I first started competing for my whole first show, I didn't want to take creatine because I was afraid it was going to make me gain weight and get me bulky. Second year I started taking creatine. I was like, this stuff is amazing. So, you know, um, I like the way I look better when I'm fit. I, f I think it personally looks better on females that fit look. Um, no, you're not going to gain a bunch of weight lifting. You're going to actually like tone up. You're going to feel better about yourself. It helps prevent osteoporosis in females because it strengthens their bones and their tendons and ligaments and joints. Um, and you're, you have more muscle. More muscle requires more calories, more food. So you burn through things more and you can actually eat more because you have more muscle. So I always say that should be the, like I said before, that should be the number one thing that a trainer should say. It's like, do you want to be able to eat more and still put on, you know, yeah. muscle? That is probably one of the biggest things. But the biggest thing for me, actually, that I think impacts women so much more than it does men, and it's in a positive way, is just the confidence boost that working out can give yeah. you. I mean, we've heard so many stories of women who have, you know, been able to make just these drastic life changes just because of that confidence boost really helps them just be able to be more assertive and really help themselves. But I always say that confidence boost is the one thing that you can take from working out in the gym and add it to every single aspect of your life. How have you been able personally to take that confidence boost that working out gives you and really use that to better your life? Well, I mean, it makes you feel better. First of all, it's like a form of therapy. So when you go to the gym, anything that bothers you and like that's happened, it, it sort of like disappears. It just, you, it's a way of working out stuff in your, in my life personally. And it's always helped me through times that were hard. 
So it, it definitely gives you confidence because you feel like, and you look better. Like I personally think I look a lot better. My clothes fit better. My, like if I was to measure myself, I'm smaller measurements actually than if I wasn't lifting all the time, but my weight is more because I have more muscle. So like people get freaked out by the scale more than anything, but you can't be freaked out by the scale. Like go by how your clothes fit, go by your measurements. Like you put a, you get more muscle, you're going to, your clothes are going to fit better and you're going to actually be smaller, but you're going to weigh more because muscle weighs more than fat. So that's what they're scared of. Like society is drilled in people's heads, scale, scale, like the number on the scale is so stupid. It drives me crazy. I want to throw all scales away. The worst is when I was taking a health class in college and they had, they had like the BMI thing where you just, it was just a computer thing where you typed in your weight and you typed in your height. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, you're like at this, you're at an unhealthy weight or whatever. And it's like, there was a friend of mine who he was a bodybuilder and he weighed like, you know, like 210 pounds. He's like six foot four. He put in, it said that he was like severely obese. And that guy was like at like six, 7% body fat at the time. So I always found that really, really amusing that it's just, you know, yeah, with society wise, people just don't realize that you know, what it says on the scale doesn't necessarily mean anything for your health as long as, you know, you have, you, you can have muscle, you can have fat. It really just is a big, de- I mean, it's really something that I think really needs to be readjusted, but talked about a, a little bit before, and it's my favorite question to ask, and it's my audience favorite because it's a multi-million dollar idea, I think, first of all, but when it comes to clothes for fit women, I always say fit guys have their own problem. When I have a guy on, we talk about that, but for women, ex- especially, I mean, I always say if you have big, broad shoulders, dresses aren't your best friend. Jeans are another thing that we hear of all the time where, I mean, if you have a, a big lower body and a small waist, good luck with jeans. But what have been some ways that you have found that you're able to compensate for the fact that your clothing options can be limited and the fact that you basically have to have two wardrobes, your prep wardrobe and your off-season wardrobe? You know, I don't have two wardrobes. I just wear the same thing because they're basically yoga pants, my Lululemons every, you know, I just wear those and those can stretch out. Um, Clothing, not workout clothing, it's jeans are hard. Like I want to buy a pair of those Levi 501 wedgie. They're high-waisted. Jeans do not, jean shorts do not look good on me because I have a butt and they just don't fit right. Um, and I'm not going to lose my butt to wear those jeans because I work so hard getting it, but it, it's, it, I have curves, but there's certain places out there that you can buy clothes now that help with, you know, curves. Um, you know, shoulders, you know, shoulders are weird, you know, cause it's, uh, when you're wearing normal clothes, um, you can fit into them fine, but you just, it's not like you're huge. I mean, I'm not huge. I'm tiny. Yeah. I don't have the shoulders anymore, but it's mostly shorts for me. And I always say anyone out there, I mean, if you want to come up with like jeans or anything like that for, for fit people, I mean, that's a multi-million dollar idea. So someone please get on it. But how was your family and friends reaction when you decided that you wanted to become a, a bodybuilder and compete? Was it supportive all the whole way or was it something where they had to get, you know, adjusted to it and then they accepted it? What was your experience like with other people's opinions and uh, what, did, what did they think about it? No, no. I think everyone thinks that this is something I always should have done. So it sort of was in my, you know, I had a six pack in high school. I, you know, I just, I, I have sort of the genetics to be able to do this type of stuff and why not use it? And, you know, I feel like it's something that God gave me. It's kind of one of those things where like it would be it would be a bad thing if you didn't do it just because you've been given the tools already basically. Yeah, I mean I just in and growing up in the type of family I did with my brother and um uh it it's just you know I just feel like it's it's was meant to be. What was your dad and brother's reaction when you won your pro card? They were very happy. You know, I don't I mean I'm a professional athlete now. Yeah. So it's they were very happy. I haven't really, um, you know, it's, I think they were really excited. I'm some person, I'm not like super emotional. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's not like, I, I feel cry and stuff, but it's not like I'll like be screaming on the phone to somebody talking or something. You know what I mean? I'm just like, yeah, I want it. So, <laughs> you know, it's, they were happy and, you know, it's, I think they were proud of me. Mm-hmm. You know, I think they're proud of me for doing it. But, um, you know, it's my boyfriend's the one that, I mean, my fiance is the one that's had to deal with me the most <laughs> through my preps and going through everything. So he was happy. Um, 
you know, he knew I could do it though. He's a great support system. And again, that is so important to have, but I got to ask cause my mom's first name is Rosanna. So the Toto song Rosanna, she doesn't, she doesn't like so much because it's played so much. How do you deal with the song Roxanne? All the, or was that something that you had to deal with all the time when you were growing up? Yeah, I did. Like I would have people sing it to me when I was like in elementary school and I didn't know what they were doing. Like <laughs> I had no idea what they were doing. They were singing. I thought it was like a TV show or something. Cause I had never heard the song before. Yeah. And then I, you know, I, I just sort of ignore it. Like, okay, so when the song comes on and I'm in a room where the song comes on somewhere, like in the gym or like somewhere, I'm like, oh my God, I just say to myself, I hope no one says anything. I hope no one says anything. I hope no one, someone, ooh, there's a deer in my yard. I hope no one says anything. So, you know, usually they don't, but I still get it all the time. I mean... I love my name though. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. I'm, I know my mom put that song as a ringtone once just for, just for a laugh, but yeah, having that names. I mean, that that's always interesting. I love to ask that, but now we go to our questionnaire part where I'm going to ask Roxanne here about a dozen or, or half dozen, I should say. So health and fitness questions that I ask all of our guests. And it's sort of like a getting to know her where we're going to see how our answers stack up to everyone else. So for our first question, what is one item that you always need to have in your fridge at all times? Um, I love that. I can't believe it's not butter spray. So <laughs> weird answer, but I, I, I spray that on like a lot of things, my rice, my eggs, everything. So they're not dry. I put it on my tuna fish. That's the first time we've heard that answer. So again, another yeah. first on the podcast. I mean, normally the most shocking answer for me has been mustard because a lot of the bodybuilders, I mean, it's zero calories, zero fat. So they just love to douse, you know, their chicken or anything that they have in mustard. So that has definitely been the most shocking answer for me. But now out of all your followers that you have on Instagram, what would be one thing that you think they'd be shocked and surprised to find out about you if they met you in person? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Maybe that I don't look like as muscular in person. Like I think they think like my shots that I sh like show is me pumped up from the gym most of the time. I don't look like that every day. Like, like I just think that like I have some guys comment. They're like, "Oh, you're so muscular. You have no idea." <laughs> like, and you know they have to chime in. And I'm like, first of all, why do you have time to do this? Um, I don't look like that every single day. So I think that's, I look normal. I just look really fit. Well, again, just like, just like we were talking about before with like, you know, after a show, that's a look that you're rarely going to have. And yeah, those shots are, you know, yeah. Like when you're most, when you're really pumped up and when you're just, I mean, that's, they're not going to last, you know, for that long. But if someone were to come up to you and say, you know, Roxanne, we made a decision. You can change one thing about the sport of bodybuilding and everyone would go along with it. What would be one thing that you would like to see changed? Oh, in the bikini division alone that we didn't have to wear heels. Yep. <laughs> so I would love that if they said, okay, girls, you don't have to wear heels anymore. <laughs> I always say, I mean, don't you put these people through enough and then you got to make them wear heels when they're doing their routine. It's like, come on people. And then like the physique girls don't have to wear it, but the figure and the bikini girls have to, it's like, come on heels. Really? So, you know, yeah. Yep. I always say that. So when you are, you know, like you said, you do look a little bit more fit than the average person. Was it hard for you, especially when you get into prep to just realize that, you know, you might get some stares or some people, you know, might, you might draw a lot of attention to yourself just based on the way that you look. Was that an adjustment for you? Yeah. You know, it's when I go out and like wear like a little top, I mean, most of the time I prep in the winter, so I'm fully clothed. I just look like a bum with a hat on and like a sweatshirt on and a jacket on. But if I go out and I have on like my leggings or something, it's, I don't really care what people think. Like, you know, I worked hard for this, so I, I, I don't know what they would think, you know, I don't judge people. So, well, yeah, abs absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, that's a great way to go through life because yeah, we've heard, you know, a lot of it is positive too. So I really do want to mention that. Yeah. I have some women coming up to me and they're like, they'll ask me what I do and stuff. And then they'll, usually they'll start telling me what they don't like about themselves and I'll like help them out with it. So I do have women coming up to me and asking me stuff, um, you know. Yep. And if you never tried bodybuilding, where do you think you'd be at in your life? What do you think you'd be up to? Oh, I have no idea. I'd be up to no good, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. But I, I just, I don't think I'd be happy. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like this, this is something in my life I was meant to do and finding and being able to realize what my passion is, which a lot of people don't ever realize their passion. 
being able to realize that I'm so grateful for and being able to do it makes me feel fulfilled in life. I mean, and I'm glad that I found my passion too. I mean, I love having people come on and share their journey. So yeah, like you, like you're talking about, I mean, once you find your passion, I mean, it's, it's so important to just stick with it because I mean, we're only on this plant for a short amount of time. So just make sure that you do what makes you happy. But also if we were to talk to you a year from today, where would you like to be at in your bodybuilding journey? Where would you like to be at just in your overall life? What are some goals that you have that you would like to see accomplished if we were to talk to you a year from today? Well, you know, I would like to, and my bodybuilding goal is to lose the muscle. Like I need to lose muscle. I need to get my legs smaller and, and, and less muscular. So basically I'm atrophying my muscles by not working them out. So I'd like my legs to be smaller. Um, maybe do a couple shows. Everybody's goal is to go to Olympia. So to do that, you have to win. You have to get points. Doing shows are expensive. So the more shows you can afford, I think, like, the more chances you get unless you get first every time, you know? So yeah, I would love to qualify to go to Olympia, but will that happen? I don't know. It's not going to kill me in my life though. I feel like, you know, in my personal life, I'm getting married next year. So, you know, that's another big step in my life. So I'm looking forward to that getting married. I've been with my fiance for over five years now, I'll be over six when we do get married. So you know, it'll be a day to remember. Yeah, that and that that is so awesome. And we wish you nothing but the best in all of that ventures. But I always love to ask if someone were to walk up to you on the street and say, do you look amazing? You know, I want to really want to get in shape. What is the best piece of advice that you try to give people who are just trying to get started? Because for so many people, I found the hardest thing is just taking that first step in the gym. But I always have found, you know, once you step into the gym, it is so hard to leave the gym. What tips do you like to try to give people just to get them started? Well, to motivate them, I just talk about what their goals are. And, you know, anybody can do anything they put their mind to. And I tell them that. I'm like, it's going to take work. I'm like, and they have to start out slow. They can't expect to work out, like, never working out to working out five days a week. Start out slow. Like, start by walking. Then go into the gym one or two times a week. And then build from there. Start out slow. It's sort of like building a foundation that you can have for life, then you'll just add from there more and more and more. That's how I always got back into the gym. I started walking my dogs longer and longer and longer. Then I'm like, okay, let's start running. Let's do this. Let's do this. And you just can't make excuses. People make excuses all the time for why they can't do this, why they can't do that. They have to make it a priority. Like they have to schedule out like it's an appointment. Like, okay, I got to go to the gym at this time. If they don't feel like they're going, they just push yourself because you'll feel so much better after. I have to push myself. I think people think I just want to go to the gym every single day. No, I don't. But you know what? I want to feel good. And leaving the gym, I always feel good. So take it slow and don't like get out of your head making excuses. Do not make excuses for yourself. And um, just focus on your goals. Focus on the end point and keep that vision in your mind always. And that will help drive you. I honestly couldn't agree with you more than that. And especially like I always like to say, you know, you really need to just take things slow at the beginning. Do not try to overtrain because I can guarantee you will not want to come back. But for our last question, I mean, so many people don't realize that sleep is just so important when it comes to your recovery, when it comes to, you know, just being able to continue working out and being able to keep being successful. I had the number one sleep specialist on the planet on for a podcast. And first of all, he was calling all the way from Oxford and he had one of those British accents where you just felt like you gained 10 IQ points just from talking to him. Uh-huh. And I, I even told him, I was like, you're going to talk the entire time. I'm just going to listen because you have one of those. I mean, it was just like chocolate to my ears, basically. We're like, I just, really? I was just like, just keep talking. But we talked yeah. about, you know, the importance of sleep and how, what are some ways that you try to get, you know, the recommended amount of sleep or your normal amount of sleep? Because especially when you're in prep, I mean, when you're that lean, sometimes it can be hard to fall asleep. And especially when you do these, some of these, you know, long workouts with a lot of cardio or, you know, any type of physical exertion, sometimes it can be harder to fall asleep. Are there any ways that you try to make sure that you get your proper amount of sleep so that you're able to go the next day? I take melatonin every single night. That's what I take. Um, I that's what I take. I've taken that forever. I can't fall asleep without melatonin. Also where I wake up super early at three 30 in the morning, even if I woke up, I take naps. I'm like a true believer in naps. When I take my best show going into winning my pro card, I was napping all the time. And just for a little bit, I was, I would say like four times a week. And I was uh, on point. It, 
you know, you need sleep. Sometimes I don't get enough sleep, but I need a lot of sleep. Um, and if I don't get it, then I'm just not doing good in life. And I just feel like crap. It's not good for your body. But um, I don't have trouble taking naps. Like I can fall asleep during the day easily when it's light out, but I cannot fall asleep at night for some reason. Yeah. And again, anyone out there who's struggling, you know, look up, maybe take some melatonin or whatever, but make sure to talk to your doctor and, you know, find out if that is good for you. But again, you guys, well, lastly, do you have anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to before we wrap things up? I'd like to say hi to my fiance, Josh. (laughs) And that's about it. No, not really. I don't, I don't, I don't know. That's fine. Again, shout out to her husband, Josh. I mean, and congratulations on the engagement and we hope that you guys have a great wedding. But now I always got to say, you know, it was just such a pleasure to have you on and, you know, talk about your journey. And I mean, I really, really appreciate it. And everyone go and give her a follow. I'll leave a link to her Instagram down below. And if anyone is listening to this in the Massachusetts area, is, uh, is there any way that they could get a hold of you other than Instagram or is it just Instagram if they're looking for, you know, personal training or any, any, uh, fitness related stuff? Yeah, so I have a website. It's uh, Rocks Body Fit, and it's rocks with an R O X uh, Body Fit uh, dot com. And they can contact me there. They can contact me on Instagram and on Facebook. I'm Roxanne Jacqueline. That's my middle name, and I go by that a lot. So any one of those, or they can email me at Roxanne at RocksBodyFit dot com. All right. I'll leave a link to all of that stuff down below. And again, you guys, we cannot thank Roxanne enough for coming on the show. I mean, it was honestly great to have you on and to talk to you about your journey. And this is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot, signing out. Have a great day, everyone.